Critical thinking rule four, be concrete and concise. Rule four is mainly about the value of expressing oneself clearly in an argument, avoiding being unnecessarily vague, abstract, or complex. All of these things can decrease the clarity of your argument. Let's break apart these two concepts of concrete and concise because they do have different meanings. Concrete means not abstract or overly general. It's specific. It's particular. It's something that's easy to imagine or to conceive of. Concise means short and to the point. So it's not unnecessarily repetitive. It's not unnecessarily wordy, verbose, long-winded, and so on. We can also talk about being clear here. Being clear is being precise. It's the opposite of vague. So that's kind of like the underlying principle that involves both being concrete and concise. That's the ultimate goal of these two things. You want to be clear in expressing your argument. So let's look at an example. Members of the species Homo sapiens engage in behavior that is often difficult for external observers to interpret in such a way that it permits them to form prospective judgments as to the probability of said behavior. That's obviously a mouthful. There is a real idea being expressed there, but how can we make it more concrete, concise, and clear? Here's an example. People often behave in unpredictable ways. That's basically all that's being asserted here. So members of a species Homo sapiens, that's just people, engage in behavior that's often difficult for external observers to interpret. That's just uh, behave in unpredictable ways. So the whole last part of that sentence is just expressing the idea that people's behavior is often unpredictable. Let's look at another example. This is a short excerpt from a book by Talcott Parsons called Societies, Evolutionary and Comparative Perspectives. So this is a textbook written a long time ago in 1966, but this example illustrates very well the sometimes unnecessarily complex and abstract and convoluted writing used by academics. For those whose roles primarily involve the performance of services, as distinguished from the assumption of leadership responsibilities, the main pattern seems to have been a response to the leadership's invoking obligations that were concomitants of the status of the membership of the societal community and various of its segmental units. The closest modern analogy is the military service performed by an ordinary citizen, except the leader of the, of the Egyptian bureaucracy did not need a special emergency to invoke legitimate obligation. So to provide some context, I've given you a picture of an ancient Egyptian mural. We do have the word Egyptian in the passage. So it's just illustrating this uh, passage is about ancient Egypt. It's still very wordy and convoluted and abstract. So it's still difficult to interpret. Let's take it one sentence at a time. The first sentence is about those whose roles primarily involve the performance of services. That's who it's about. Um, that's distinguished from those who have leadership responsibilities. And it's talking about the main pattern being a response to leaderships invoking obligations, etc. So what is this sentence really saying? What is it really getting at? And how can we break down the basic idea more simply? This sentence can be expressed as subjects in ancient Egypt performed compulsory labor for the rulers. So the word subject here is just being used for any person who didn't have political authority or great political authority in ancient Egypt. And um, the basic idea expressed by this sentence is that the rulers of ancient Egypt had the right to get forced labor from their subjects as a kind of tax. And actually this was practiced by a lot of ancient societies. Another example includes China. Um, but notice how simple the idea really is and how unnecessarily complex it's made by that sentence on the left. Let's look at the second sentence more carefully to break that one down. The closest modern analogy is the military service performed by an ordinary citizen. So that first clause isn't so bad. It's talking about military service being performed by ordinary citizens in contrast to professional soldiers, for example. 
except that the leader of the Egyptian bureaucracy did not need a special emergency to invoke legitimate obligation. So what's this really saying? This is similar to a modern military draft, except that no special emergency was needed. That's the basic idea being expressed there. So just a reminder, this is an extreme case because academic writing, uh, there's a kind of convention or unwritten rule that it's supposed to sound complex and very thoughtful and knowledgeable. Um, this trend is probably less now than it was in previous decades, but it's still very strong. So something to keep in mind is that actually, according to research by psychologists, the simpler you keep your words or writing, the more intelligent you seem to an audience. It seems paradoxical, but basically it's, it makes sense because if people can understand clearly the point you're making, you're gonna seem more persuasive and probably more informed and knowledgeable as well. Whereas if it just comes off as a bunch of complicated blather, then you're gonna seem like you're not really talking about anything. So we can get the, both, the best of both worlds here by being clear, concrete, and concise. Next up is rule five, build on substance, not overtone when making an argument. 